أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم محمد ثم الصلاة والسلام على آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين الميامين المذلومين واللعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين من يوم عداوتهم إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتاب وهو أصدق القائلين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الله يبدأ الخلق ثم يعيده ثم إليه ترجعون صلوة على محمد وآل محمد Tonight is our second lecture on the subject of the origin and the return or al-mabda wal-ma'ad. And uh, last night we began discussing our relationship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what we mean when we speak of spiritual wayfaring, journeying towards Allah or coming from Allah and then returning to Him. And we said that the best explanation we have found so far is that from the Muslim mystic philosophers who tell us that the reality of the matter is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only truth and the only reality and that the rest of creation simply emanates from him through a process that is called a tajalli and uh, this manifestation as well is not in the sense that a part of his essence comes forth from him and reveals itself as creation, but rather it is his names and his attributes, his asma and his sifat that present themselves as creation. And this is not an easy concept to understand, but we promised inshallah that as we go along it will become easier to understand what is it that these mystic philosophers are trying to tell us. But the fact that they speak of a manifestation through a process of emanation, that itself tells us that what they're suggesting is that from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to all forms of his creation, the relationship is not independent and is not directly to each form of creation but rather there is a gradation of being there is a hierarchy through which creation flows so there are higher forms of beings and creations that uh, um, are closer in a sense from the point of emanation to lower forms of creation as you come down that vertical hierarchy we of course are not aware of how many levels there are in this vertical hierarchy but it actually does not matter whether it is ten or it is a million um, what matters is that we understand that there are different levels we also alluded briefly that every level is dominated by the level above it and the world that we live in, that we, most of us, would be aware of, is generally referred to in the Qur'an and in Hadith as Al-Mulk, which sometimes is translated as the kingdom, but it is actually the corporal world. And that level of reality, or that realm that is just above us, is referred to as Malakut. And Malakut is roughly translated as the dominion, because it dominates our world. <coughs> And that is why you will find in many du'as and in many ahadith we speak of Rabbul Mulki wal Malakut, the Lord of the corporal world and the spiritual world, the Lord of this realm and the Lord of the dominion that is above this realm. But as we go on we shall begin to see that Malakut is not necessarily just the world above us, but every higher level is the Malakut to the level below it. 
when we come downwards in that form of descent we talked about we you know scholars will use terminologies that are different from the terms they will use going upwards but in reality it is the same forms of reality um, that are just being referred to by different terms to make it easier for us to distinguish the two so for example for example when they speak of the descent from Allah how his blessings come down to us for example they will speak of Lahut and then Jabarut and then Malakut and then Mulk and so on when we go backwards in the form of ascent they will speak of Dunya and then they will speak of Alamul Barzakh and then they will speak of Akhirah or Yawmul Qiyamah or Qiyamatul Qubra so Barzakh will sometimes be referred to as Qiyamatul Sughra and then the Akhirah will be referred to as Al Qiyamatul Kubra and so on so there are terminologies that are being referred to but in reality every higher level dominates the lower level our concern for at least the next three nights is going to be mostly with the world that is just above us the Malakut versus our Mulk because we need to understand that and that is the nearest to us even as we gain higher realization or awareness we become more spiritual it is natural that we would first encounter this Malakut that is uh, directly above our world so because of that we can now speak of the visible world alam shuhud and alam al ghayb the, 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 the invisible world we can speak of the physical and the metaphysical we can speak of uh, um, the, the, the body and the spirit a lot of times when we speak of physical and spiritual we are talking of these two uh, realms as we begin discussing and comparing these two worlds, Al-Mulk and Al-Malakut, there are two things that will become very, very clear to us, abundantly clear to us. The first is that all these different levels and worlds that we speak of are directly connected to each other. They are not two separate distinct worlds, as we mentioned last night, that if you do not subscribe to the teachings of these mystic philosophers, then in your theological understanding, the world and the hereafter are two separate realities that do not interact with each other. But if we subscribe and we begin to embrace what these mystic philosophers are telling us, then one thing that will become very clear to us is that these worlds are not disconnected from each other because there's a gradation of being and therefore we are directly connected to the Malakut and by extension then we are connected all the way to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The other thing paradoxically that we will notice is that when we speak of the horizontal plane of existence we are talking of our world. When we talk of the vertical plane of existence or the hierarchy we are talking of this realm by which we are connected to a higher world and the higher world all the way to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but paradoxically even though they are intricately connected to each other they do not operate with the same rules and principles they work with different physics in these two different worlds and a big part of what we will be um, discussing in the coming nights the next three nights is the difference between how this higher realms operate versus how our world operates and that will also help us understand difficult concepts outside the dimension of space and time so let us take the first point that we make that our world with the higher world is intricately connected when we say it is intricately connected what we mean is that there is a natural flow and a gradation of being one way to understand this more easily is to take for example a concept that is given to us by the famous mystic philosopher Mullah Sadra. Mullah Sadra teaches that the human body and the human soul in reality is made from the same essence. He is able to come to this conclusion, of course he undergoes great spiritual exercises and when he speaks he is speaking from what he has experienced through direct uh, uh, um, self-realization direct knowledge knowledge through presence and in his understanding when he sees reality he tells us that when you come to this level what you will find is that because there is a flow there is a gradation of being there is a manifestation from the source all the way going down the essence of what is being manifested is the same and in one of the later nights we will attempt to prove this scientifically as well to the best of my ability not being a scientist of course but he tells us that the body and the soul is made of the same material 
we as laymen not being uh, aware of metaphysics and philosophy have always assumed that the body and the spirit are very two different things one is dense physical bones blood tissue the other is something uh, we don't quite know what the soul is isn't it we imagine it's probably you know some sort of a subtle blob that is just floating around in our bodies and somehow survives after we die right but what is the soul what is the spirit and it becomes very difficult to explain to a scientist or somebody who is skeptical about life after death but when you try to understand it from Mullah Sadr's perspective, it begins to make sense. He says, when a child is born, their soul is not heavily formed. It is like a fetus inside your body. Just like a fetus is in the womb of its mother, your soul is like that. And that is why he says, a young child does not display a lot of human tendencies. It often behaves and shows animal-like behaviors because its soul is less evolved. And then as you live in this world and you grow and you acquire knowledge and you acquire more awareness and you mature, your soul slowly begins to take shape and form. And as you act, as you perform actions and deeds, your thoughts, your actions, your decisions in lives begin to give that soul a particular shape and form. So when you die, what happens is the outer layer simply falls off. It is like shedding an old cloth or it is like peeling off the layer of an onion, for example. Or it is like the case of a snake that once in a while sheds its entire skin and comes out and emerges with a new skin. And so what comes out and what is left over at death is a new person. But that soul that has come out is made from the same material as what you saw in the body, but it is far more subtle and therefore those who still reside in the body unless they have attained a high level of consciousness and they are highly spiritually attuned to see that spirit they will not be able to see the spirit in their mind this person has died he is gone forever we will never see him again but in reality he is present and if you had that level of awareness you would be able to see him and that's why we have abundant you know evidence from hadith of, of not just the Aima alayhi salam, but even of you know pious scholars who are able to communicate with the dead, who are able to talk to people in this other realm that is the Alamul Barzakh. So we have so many such incidents of the Imams as well. For example, you know there is this famous incident of Amirul Mu'minin Ali ibn Abi Talib sallallahu You know he goes to Wadi Salam. Um, in, 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 in Najaf and, uh, or, uh, you know, near Kufa and he stands there and for a long time he is talking and there is a companion besides him who is just sitting there and he's standing and he's sitting and he's standing and he's sitting and I've mentioned this whole incident um, in a series of lectures you know, that I did earlier in 2012 on Alamul Barzakh and the companion asks him you know, what are you doing and he says I'm talking to the spirits of those who have passed away and they're sitting in clusters talking amongst themselves and I'm lecturing to them right and when you go to the cemetery even here when you go to the cemetery there is a dua that you recite at the entrance right assalamu alayka ya ahli la ilaha illallah min ahli la ilaha illallah you know read the translation of that you will see that you are not just blessing people who have died you are talking to someone as if he is in front of you you're talking to someone who is alive the fact that you are being asked to, to, to address the dead shows you that Islam does not believe that they have vanished or gone to a different world that is inaccessible to you. That they are present. It is not just that the Imams who are present and who you can talk to when you go for ziyara, but you can speak to your loved ones as well. You do not see them, but they see you. And there is lots of such evidence. And in fact, in a hadith from Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq sallallahu wa sallam wa alayhim, he says that if you could see the soul of a person who's passed away, you would be able to recognize him. Again, something I have mentioned previously, which therefore again tells us that the soul or spirit is not just some subtle wisp of air or some blob in the body, but it actually resembles your physical body. There is just an outer layer that is just peeled and removed so that now those who are still in the body cannot see anymore what's left over. But what's left actually looks very much like you. If one lived a righteous life with integrity and piety, that which was left over because the actions have an influence on the spirit, it would look like the person, but it might be far more enhanced and beautiful. And if a person lived a life of wretchedness and sin, 
uh, then it might look somewhat deformed but still recognizable as to who that person might be. Now I want to leave that at, at that for now and then inshallah we will develop that uh, uh, later on. But another point that we mentioned um, last night is that in this relationship of malakut to mulk, right? So, so the whole point of mentioning Mullah Sadr's argument that the soul and the body is made of the same material, one is subtle and one is dense, is this point that they are so tightly integrated that there is a gradation of being, that they're directly connected to each other. You don't actually jump from one you know, form to something completely different. You just shed layers as you ascend back towards a higher realm. But another point we mentioned last night was that the previous or higher world completely dominates and encompasses the lower world. We, we used a term in Arabic called al-ihata. Al-ihata is to encompass, to surround, to besiege, to completely overwhelm something and cover it up completely. And now when you begin looking at the Quran, you begin seeing that there is a constant hint at this idea that the higher realm, all the way up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, completely covers you, even though you are not conscious of this fact. For example, if you look at uh, Surah Fussilat, which is chapter 41 of the Quran, verse 40, 40, 54, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah innahum fi miryatim min liqa'i rabbihim. Lo, they are in doubt that they will one day meet their Lord. Now we'll talk about this liqa of Allah, what does it mean? We'll have a separate lecture just on that. But Allah says, look, they are in doubt that they will one day meet their Lord. Allah innahu bi kulli shay'im muhit. But look, Allah already encompasses and besieges them completely. In other words, they are in doubt, will I ever meet Allah? But the point is, He's already there, He's already meeting them. He has already encompassed them completely. And then again in, in Surah Al-Buruj, which is chapter 85 of the Quran, verse 20, He says, بَلِلَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا فِي تَكْذِيب. But those who are faithless, they are in denial, they dwell in denial, they deny the existence of any higher realm or an afterlife or God or a world outside the physical uh, um, perception. Wallahu min waraihim muhit. But Allah already encompasses them all together. And not just Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but if you move one level higher to this alamul barzakh, and then you move one level higher and you speak of akhirah, now you are talking of paradise and hell. There are so many ahadith from our Aima salam to insist that a part of a Muslim's faith is he must believe that paradise and hell exist even today. And that one who denies their existence and says they are to be created in the future, his faith is incomplete or he is not uh, um, fully complying with what it requires of one to be a Muslim. Now look at this verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is in Surah Al-Ankabut, which is chapter 29 of the Quran, verse 54. يَسْتَعْجِلُونَكَ adab. You know, this was happening with all the prophets. When they would come to their people, they would warn them and they would caution them that if you do not listen to what your Lord is telling you, then you will invite affliction and chastisement upon you. There will be adab that will befall you. So now the Messenger of Allah is saying to the people that adab will come to you if you deny the message of your Lord, if you turn away in rebellion. So they in turn mock the Prophet and they say, bring this punishment of your Lord. Where is it? He is threatening us with punishment. Why do you keep saying he's going to bring adab, he's going to bring adab? Bring it. Hasten it. Tell your God to bring it now. They ask you to hasten the punishment. So why is Allah not sending the punishment then? The reason He is not sending it is Jahannam has already surrounded and encompassed them. They are saying hasten the punishment, but they are already in punishment. They just don't see it. They are shielded through heedlessness and because of the physical body that does not make them realize that. It's like being in a building and outside there is fire raging and you're saying, bring the punishment. Step out of the building and then see what there is. So as soon as they die, they wake up to a new reality and they see that that adab that they were inviting, they were already existing and living in it. And inshallah we will have uh, an entire lecture again on, on, on Akhirah and how do we relate to paradise, hellfire, hereafter, resurrection and so on with the 
subject that we are discussing. If you can recite a salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. In essence, so when we say that the higher realm encompasses the lower realm, what we are saying is that the metaphysical world, it colors or it dyes everything that is in mulk. Malakut gives character and, and an appropriate quality to everything that is in mulk. One way in which mystic philosophers explain this to us is they say it is like the example of words and meanings. If you think about words, what we write and what we say, really in their own right, they seem meaningless, isn't it? When you write words, it is just squiggles, it is just marks on paper. You take a pen and paper and you're just drawing lines and dashes and, and you know, putting crosses and so on. It doesn't have any purpose until you associate meaning to those squiggles and you say this is the letter A, this is the letter B. When I combine this squiggle mark with this squiggle mark and I write for example this cross with this line and make a T and put an R and put an E and put an E, now this T-R-E-E -E represents something. It gives meaning to something we all know and can identify with. The same thing with speech. Speech as such is just sound. I'm making sound from my voice box, from my throat, and I'm just articulating sound. That sound is just empty sound. And you on your side, there is just sound bouncing off your eardrums and just coming into your mind, which is meaningless. Right? If I was speaking in um, Chinese and you were only understanding in Greek, right? That is exactly what it would sound like, just empty, meaningless sound. It would have no purpose. But when we associate meaning to those sounds and to those marks, now they have some purpose to them. In the same manner, what we manifest in this world, what happens in this world, it appears this world is independent and operating on its own, but it is directly tied and represented by something in a higher realm that we will be talking about in the coming nights, inshallah. And, and uh, that which it represents is actually more real. This is the other thing we will talk about perhaps even tonight that the higher up you go, it gets more real and not more... When we say it's more spiritual at a higher realm, it doesn't mean that it is, uh, you know, less real. It is actually the opposite. It is more solid and more um, real. And so the whole idea of returning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, journeying towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is this idea of removing the veils of heedlessness from our uh, spiritual eyes, if you like, and becoming aware that the greatest obstacle between us and this higher realm is self-will. We keep saying that the greatest obstacle to knowing God is self-will. Why? Because self-will is what refuses to surrender to Allah. And as long as I hold on to that self-will in rebellion and I refuse to surrender to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then it strengthens the idea of my separateness from God. We need to understand that, that this is the problem with self-will, that it strengthens the idea of separateness from God. And this ties very well to our discussion that there is nothing separate from Allah because He and He alone is the only truth with a capital T. He and He alone is the only reality with a capital R. He and He alone is the only true consciousness with a capital C. And He and He alone is the only being with a capital B. Everything else is simply manifesting, radiating, emanating, uh, um, from him. Now, um, we have said that uh, the other point that we will see time and time again, that even though we are directly connected to this higher realm, they operate differently, that we will start seeing from tomorrow night, inshallah. But the result of the fact that the higher realm oper operates with a different set of rules, the physics in the higher realm is different from the physics of this realm, this also explains to us why people who attain a higher spiritual level are able to perform feats and miracles that oppose logic and that defy our understanding of physics or gravity or whatever it is. When we recognize people who are spiritual as having a sixth sense, for example, or being able to traverse land on you know, a long distance in a very short time, what we call tayyul ard, for example, one of the ways in which we might be able to explain this is you will see from tomorrow night how differently the higher realm operates as opposed to how our realm operates. How the physics in Al-Malakut is different from the physics of Al-Mulk. And that means that if I attain a higher level of spirituality, if I begin to realize and see things that others do not, 
and I become aware of them, I now am able to tap into you know, a means that others are not able to. And this will tie directly into a lot of other things. We say, for example, there is a name of Allah that is the greatest name of all, isn't it? We call it Al-Ismul A'adham. And we have been taught from the time we are young that if you know Ismul A'adham or Ismi A'adham, then you can do anything you want. And we have always wanted that name that gives us godlike powers, isn't it? And the only thing we think that is stopping us is we just don't know what that name is. And if only somebody would tell us what that name is. Now, do we think that if someone was to tell us that name, we would be able to do anything we want? No. Why? Because if that was the only problem, then there are 99 names. Try every one of them. One of them should work. If that doesn't work, take Dua Joshan Al-Kabir. There's a thousand names. One of them will work. Right? So you're trying to bring a dead man to life, you try, Ya Hayyu, doesn't work, try, Ya Qayyum, try, Ya Jabbar, try. One of them should work. What does that tell you? It tells you, it is not just sufficient to know the Isma Adam. You must be able to know the meaning behind it and have that responsibility and Ma'rifah to use that name appropriately. Without the right Ma'rifah, you will not be able to tap into the power of that name. And that is why we are saying, that as we attain a higher level of spirituality, we now become aware of the physics of this higher realm. It's with us even now. The power to walk on water is there and available to each one of us. But we are just not aware of how to tap into that power. And we will develop this subject more, inshallah, as we go on. Now, tonight there are two important things that I want to talk about, and hopefully, inshallah, not go so over time as I did last night. One is the issue of the opposition to philosophy and that, you know, what are the common objections to using Islamic philosophy in understanding our faith and how do we respond to that? And the other is a few more pointers as to why this science is so important and why it is so important that we discuss what we are discussing. The first objection that we find when we bring out this issue of uh, falsafa is that Islamic philosophy is foreign to Islam. That all these ideas that you talk about, Mullah Sadra and Suhra Wardi and Imam Khomeini and Allama Tabatabai, you know, these, their roots are from Ibn Sina, Avicenna. And Ibn Sina took this from Greek philosophers like Aristotle. So this is Greek philosophy. This is what is called peripatetic philosophy, Masha'un. You're bringing their philosophy into Islam. The Imams never spoke about all this gradation of being and wahdatul wujud and you know, this has nothing to do with Islam. Our response to that is first and foremost, this is not true. It is not true because Greek philosophy eventually evolved into what is called Western philosophy today. When you study Western philosophy, its origins start with Greek philosophy, where they discuss you know, the teachings of uh, Socrates and Plato and Aristotle and so on. And one major difference we said last night between Islamic falsafa and Western philosophy is that Western philosophy restricts itself to ratiocination, to using the mind alone through reflection only to arrive at any conclusion. Islamic philosophy, on the other hand, insists that even though we seek the truth to everything, the truth will not be known simply by reading books or attending courses at the university or by reflecting or by listening to lectures. The truth will only happen through a physical and spiritual metamorphosis. You will have to undergo spiritual exercises. You will have to undergo some hardship, some self-mortification, and you will have to transform as a person so that your perception of reality changes so that you see the world differently, so that you have a direct one-on-one -on -one personal encounter with the truth, with the capital T. And until you have this ilm al-huduri, knowledge by presence, direct knowledge, you will not arrive at the truth. And this understanding is actually the contribution of Islamic philosophy to mankind. You will not find this teaching in other faiths. It might be taught in different ways perhaps, but you cannot directly say that this came from the Greek philosophers. That is the one thing. The other thing is, let us suppose that some of the ideas that Mullah Sadra and, and Sohra Wardi and Imam Khomeini and Allama Tabatabai and all the other great, uh, and even in our present day, Ayatollah Jawadi Amuli and so on, who are great philosophers, 
let us suppose they, 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 they studied and took ideas from Ibn Arabi and Ibn Sina and so on and they took it from the Greek philosophers our teaching in Islam is what? seek knowledge even if it is from China when the Prophet وسلم, said this Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad there were no Muslims in China right the heritage we have got from our Imams is that knowledge should not don't look at who is saying see what is being said and therefore we should be open-minded enough to say that what was offered by them what amongst those teachings agrees with Quran and Hadith and if it agrees there is nothing wrong with that the Imams might not have used specific terms that philosophers use they might not have used tashkik al wujud and asalat al wujud and wahdat al wujud and you know all these different things mahiya and so on essence and quiddity and so on but in their teachings what were they talking about and in fact there is evidence and a hadith that i have reference to where imam al sadiq alayhi salam actually quotes and references allahumma salli ala muhammad wa ali muhammad he mentions Aristotle in his hadith. He presents an argument and he says Aristotle presented this argument to other people. The Imam Masum is quoting him. So this is the other thing. The other thing as well we say to those who are opposed to philosophy and they say that it is foreign to Islam and that we should not take Islam, we should not bring it into any discussion in Islam. We say that there are many ayats of Quran and ahadith that you will not be able to explain convincingly if you shun philosophy completely. Simple examples. In Surah Al-Baqarah, which is chapter 2 of the Quran, verse 115, Allah says, tuwallu fa thamma wajhu Allah. So wherever you turn, there you will encounter the face of God. Explain this to me without philosophy. Wherever you turn, there you will encounter the face of God. Another verse of Quran, Surah Al-Hadid, chapter 57, verse 3. He is the first and he is the last. And he is the manifest and he is the hidden. How can, not that he was the first and he shall be the last. No, right now, he is the first now and he is the last right now. And not that he is hidden now and he will become manifest. No. And he is apparent and manifest right now and he is hidden right now. Now explain to me without philosophy how God is apparent and hidden at the same time. And how he is the first and the last at the same time. The more you look at these things, you become convinced that... There is a need to look at what philosophy has to offer because it gives us a beautiful explanation to these verses of Quran that fit and align very well with other ahadith and other ayats of Quran. So the second objection that we find from scholars who are opposed to philosophy is they say that you know, you talk about this idea of going back to Allah and then you talk about being annihilated in God, you know, fana fillah and then subsisting in God and baqa billah and so on. It is kufr to suggest that something would separate itself from God. A part of him would come out and then go back to him and then get annihilated and then become part of him and subsist in him and so on and so forth. Now this objection arises because those who object to it are again trying to understand this in physical terms. And we said last night that one of the challenges of understanding this subject is turning our minds around so that we don't think of these things in special temporal terms in terms of space and time or physical terms you see when you turn this around if Allah would have created me as a physical being that is a separate existence from him then that is a valid question that how could I have been created and extracted from Allah and then how can I go back and be annihilated in him and subsist in him but supposing I don't have a reality of my own and it is just a ray from the sun, then the question is that when the rays shine from the sun, does anything diminish from the sun? When an object throws its shadow on the wall, does that shadow decrease anything from the object? 
if an object stands in front of a mirror and that mirror image reflects onto another mirror which reflects onto another mirror and that reflects onto a million mirrors or a trillion mirrors does it decrease anything from the original essence or object that is looking in the mirror so when you separate this idea that it is not in the sense of you know a physical uh, um, separation from God then it sorts itself out the third objection is that we cannot know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is a very common objection that look Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beyond our understanding we should not talk about Allah we should just talk about Muhammad and Ali Muhammad alayhi salam because they are within our reach my question is can anyone here stand up and claim that they can understand Muhammad and Ali Muhammad is there a man yet born who can say that I have ma'rifa of Nur Muhammadiyah is there you will not find a Muslim unless he is a madman who will tell you that I know who Hussein is. I will tell you who is Hussein. Is there anyone who can say I have Ma'arif of Hussein? So that means now let's not talk about the Imams as well because we don't have their Ma'arif. Right? Let's just talk about ourselves. So here's the problem. The Quran is there but I can't talk about it because we're not supposed to understand this. Only the Imams can understand that. Right? They were not here to teach us about the Quran. The Quran is only for them. Now when I listen to what the Imams are saying, I look at Nahjul Balagha, I see Amir al-Mu'minin is talking about Tawheed. Every other sermon he's praising Allah, describing things in very deep philosophical terms. I look at Kitab al-Irshad of Sheikh Mufid, I find Imam al-Sadiq is having philosophical debates with atheists. I look at Sheikh Saduq's Uyun Akhbar al-Rida, two volumes. The Imam is having debates with people of all kinds of faiths, deep, deep philosophical debates on proof of God, existence of God, and so on and so forth. I look at Hadith Mufaddal of the sixth Imam. Again, there is profound ideas being taught there. I look at the Hadith of the sixth Imam. He says, Allah revealed Surah Al-Ikhlas, Surah Qul Hu Allahu Ahad, and the last verses of Surah Al-Hadid, because he knew there will come a future generation in time who will be able to understand the meaning of these verses. What do I do with all this hadith? So I have the Quran, but I'm not supposed to comment on it. I have the hadith, but we're not supposed to talk about it. We're only supposed to talk about the Imams themselves. The question is, is this fair to the Imams? Are we being fair to them? And that is why I have said this time and time again, that when people ask me to define the Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt, who are they? My standard definition to everyone is, first and foremost, they are teachers of Tawheed. They are teachers of Tawheed. The main reason why any messenger of God came was to guide people back to God. To show them how to journey towards God. And we said that journey is not physical. And the Imams as the heirs to the Prophets, their mission is the same. They are teachers of Tawheed. Now is it not ironic that our Imams have the most profound and the deepest understanding of Tawheed, but our enemies call us grave worshippers? And the most repulsive understanding of Tawheed is the Tawheed of the Wahhabi. Because the Wahhabi's God sits on a throne. On Thursday nights he physically comes down and then he goes up. On the day of judgment he puts his left foot in the fire of hell. Until the fire of hell says enough, enough. When the fire of hell says halim, hal min mazid, hal min mazid. You know, are there any more? Yawma naqulu li jahannam halim tala'ati. Then God puts his left foot in the fire of hell and hell says, enough, enough, O oh Lord, because his left foot is MashaAllah, right? The most repulsive Tawheed is that of the Wahhabi, but he is called Muwahid. And the highest understanding of Tawheed is mine and I am called a grave worshipper. Where did we drop the ball? Where? I will tell you where we dropped the ball. We dropped the ball because we took the Imams but not their teachings. We took the Imams, but we, not, we, we didn't take their teachings. Even when we take the praise right, from our Imams, who is the Imam we praise the most? Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. We say Ali is the madhar ilahi. 
he manifests divine attributes, right? There are people who speak of him in glowing terms of how Ali demonstrates things, why people were misguided and they thought Ali was God, right? When Ibrahim alayhi salam challenges Nimrud and tells him that my God brings the dead back to life, the king kills a man and spares another one and says, I can do the same thing. Then how does Ibrahim defeat him? He says, my Lord brings the sun from the east and sets it in the west. You bring it from the other side if you are God. Ali did that. So he manifests things that give people reason to say he is God. right? But who is Ali? Now what we do is we praise him and praise him and praise him to say, look at how God manifested his power, his knowledge, his ability in Ali. Amazing, definitely. But then we stop there. We forget that the reason why Ali came was to point us to Allah. We said, don't talk about Allah. That is too deep. And in doing that, we are unfair to Ali. Because if he came now, he would be disappointed. And I've given this example before. That if you take an infant in your hand and you see a full moon before you. And you point to the full moon. The infant will look at your finger. He will not look at the moon. Because he doesn't have the maturity to look that far. And the more you wag your finger and say, look, look, look at that beauty. You've got to look at your finger. Everything besides God is an ayah. So Ali is saying, look at Allah. And he does a miracle. Look at Allah. He lifts the gate. He is showing you the power of Allah. We are looking at Ali. We are not looking at Allah. He is trying to show us something. And I will give you proof for this. When you ask Amir al-Mu'minin himself to describe himself in the most glowing terms after the demise of the Prophet, blessings and peace be on him, what does he say? He says, Ma lillahi ayatun akbar minni. Allah does not have a sign or an ayah greater than I. I am the greatest sign of Allah. He describes himself. Undoubtedly, he is Naba'ul Azim. He is the greatest news of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after the Prophet. But when you praise Ali and you bring him to that level, after that as well, let mankind see the God that Ali introduces in Nahjul Balagh. So that they understand who are the rightful owners of Tawheed. That Tawheed should come from the teaching of the Ahlul Bayt and not from those who are their enemies. I will start drawing towards a conclusion. The fourth thing we want to say as well is that if we look at how our universe operates as well, we constantly see that Allah does not operate directly. He operates through a process of gradation. Look at how birth occurs. If Allah wanted, he could have created each one of us the way he created Adam salam. But he put a place in process where we are created through our fathers and mothers and they are created through their fathers and mothers. So our birth takes place through causes and effect. Then look at our death as well. He does it through angels. Look at the rain and the sustenance he sends down. He does it also through you know, cause effect, cause effect. It rains and the ground becomes fertile and crops grow and the animals eat the crops and we eat the animals and so on and so forth. There's a constant relationship and dependency of one to the other. Look at the hadith on you know, how people are preserved. There are guardian angels. There are angels who record your deeds. When you die, there is munkar and nakir. In paradise, there are angels who welcome you and usher you into paradise. In hellfire, there are gatekeepers. Um, revelation comes down from God. It doesn't come directly from him. It comes through Jibra'il, to the prophet. Right? There is this constant idea to the point that even when Allah is dealing with us and he wants to repel evil in this world, he wants humans to repel evil from others. He says, In Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 251, he says, had, it, had not Allah repelled some people with other people, the evil with the good, then corruption would have spread in the earth. And, uh, you know, when it comes to charity, when it comes to humanitarian acts, again, he wants people to help people. Um, guiding people, he does through prophets, he does through imams, he uses wasila constantly. All these, when you think about them deeply and you start reflecting on them, it starts becoming apparent that there is a hierarchy on which Allah uses a vertical dimension in which there is a gradation 
uh, uh, of being and there is a manifestation and an emanation through which this whole process occurs. The reason why the day of judgment is so magnificent and so, you know, so special is because that is the day when creation has a direct one-on-one -on -one encounter with truth and reality itself, i.e. with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. And so what we want to say here is that philosophy is a tool, just like mathematics or science. We should not take a position where we feel threatened by it or where we you know, say um, you know, that it is a dangerous science and that it should not be taught and that it should be shunned and that people who teach philosophy are teaching things that are against the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt Nor am I suggesting that you must accept everything that I am preaching to you. Right? At the end of the day, whether it's Mullah Sadra or it's Imam Khomeini or it's Allama Tabatabai or whoever that mystic philosopher is, none of them are masum. And in their views, they may have made mistakes as well. But we as a community um, need to at least have this maturity where we are able to listen to views from others and open our minds to, possi to possibilities and then take from it what resonates with us. I'm not at all suggesting that we dabble with things that are wrong or that we invite speakers that are controversial who plant seeds of doubt in our children's minds or that we question the absolute fundamentals of our faith. This is not at all what I'm saying. But what I'm saying when we speak of higher sciences, instead of polarizing ourselves or just accepting one view and saying because I do taqlid of this or I'm opposed on this camp, I'm against anything this one says, Muslims at one point were the leaders of science and knowledge in the world. And I believe the reason why Muslims lost their place in leading science, in leading humanity, in being the leaders of everything in this world is because we became very intolerant, we became very narrow-minded, we became close-minded, we refused to listen to anything except our version and our narrative of the truth. We must have the capacity, especially those of us who have the knowledge and the ability to then look at an argument forcefully and see how it stays in relation to Quran and Hadith, whether it agrees or it does not, we have to have that openness to be able to look at that and then um, share that accordingly with our uh, people in our community, inshallah. So as a conclusion, just a couple of points and I have ended for tonight. We have said that one of the reasons and benefits of studying this science is that there are many ahadith and many ayats of Quran that cannot be explained without philosophy. And in the coming days and nights, we will continue to give examples of this. Secondly, we have said that our understanding of life, of religion, of reality, of the hereafter would be very superficial and very simple and very naive if we simply look at it from a physical perspective and we ignore the metaphysical. The third thing is that there are many things that we say about the Prophet ﷺ and the Imams السلام, that we would not be able to justify and explain as, as, as monotheists unless we bring in this philosophical understanding. For example, the hadith from the Imams that says, Nahnu Asma'ullah, we are the names of Allah. How do you explain what it means that an Imam is a name of Allah if you shun philosophy? You immediately get accused of dabbling in shirk. Look at Ziyaratul Jami'ah. Jami'a Kabira. Ziyaratul Jami'a Kabira, you know, a lot of our du'as are from our Imams. A lot of our ziyarats were composed by ulama. But there are some ziyarats that are highly authentic because they are given to us from a ma'asum Imam, like Ziyarat Ashura, like Ziyarat Warith, Ziyarat Aminullah. And in that vein, Ziyarat Jami'a Kabira is one of our authentic, you know, highly regarded ziyarat and treasures that is given to us from our 10th Imam, Imam Ali Al Hadi, Salawatullahi wa Salamu Alayhim. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. And uh, in this ziyara, you know, I can't give you examples now because of you know, the lack of time. But if you take the time to read this, there are many things in this ziyara that you will not be able to explain and not get accused of shirk unless you bring in the philosophical understanding that we are talking about. You know, when the Imam says things to, when, when the Imam teaches us to address them, the Imams, and say that it is because of you and by you that Allah brings rain down, and that it is by you that Allah holds the heavens from falling down onto the earth, and it is by your light that Allah radiates and lightens the entire universe, and so on. You know, these sort of phrases cannot be explained without the help of 
philosophy. So this becomes a very important science that is not just a nice to have, that's something we talk about because it's fanciful or a change, but it is actually crucial and important for us to know and understand in order for us to be able to defend our faith and present uh, uh, our understanding of how we understand Muhammad and Ali Muhammad alayhim. Afdal salatu wa salam. Okay, there were, there were two other um, matters that I was going to m uh, mention as well in terms of why this science is important, but uh, they require some more time and inshallah I will uh, um, uh, continue with that tomorrow night uh, before starting our subject for tomorrow as well. But it suffices to say from what we have seen tonight that yes, there is a vibrant and active you know, uh, a group of scholars even today who are opposed to philosophy. And uh, by no means am I claiming to be able to compete with their knowledge. Uh, but there is also an equally vibrant and active community of scholars even today who are very learned in philosophy and who are presenting the other side and argument as well. And it is for us to talk about these and look at how they present it. And in the coming night, inshallah, as, we, as I said last night, as we pile the evidence of Quran and Hadith, we will find it harder and harder to deny that philosophy as a tool and as a means has a very important place in our understanding of religion, even in our aqaid, uh, not just in, in, in uh, falsafa, but even in our aqaid, we need the help of this science to understand uh, um, these, these, these higher concepts, inshallah. If you can recite a louder salawat, Allah Muhammad. <laughs> Tonight is the second night of Muharram al-Haram and uh, we continue paying our respects to the household of the Prophet and in particular in these days and nights you know our thoughts and our focus is with Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam and with the mother of Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam and uh, you know I, I was speaking to the um, chairman just a little earlier before I came in and uh, this is you know alhamdulillah proof of not just the vibrant knowledgeable and pious community we have here at the Masumin Islamic Center but even the you know the individuals who lead us the volunteers the management committee you know the proof of their God consciousness is how they think and how they they they, they operate as well is very heartwarming and, uh, you know, one of the things we talked about is that it is our belief that when a majlis of Hussein is held anywhere, then the spirits of the Aima alayhi salam attend that majlis as well. And uh, it is our belief, as I said last night, that they come and they bless those who take part in this majlis. But in addition to that, you know, what the chairman was saying to me and what we were discussing is that just like when we have a majlis in our home even though people don't need to be invited to the majlis of Hussein you know if if you are having a wedding if you're having anything you don't go unless you're invited but if there is a majlis of Hussein you don't need to be invited and the person who holds the majlis will never ask you I didn't invite you or look at you suspiciously if anything he will be delighted that you showed up without being invited but nonetheless, we call people and we tell them, please come to my majlis. And therefore, out of that adab, we should also have this prayer and hope in our hearts and a form of wanting to invite the mother of Hussein to say to Sayyidah alayhi salam, that even though there are millions of people around the world tonight and in these days and nights who are holding the majlis for your son and crying for him, and where angels are crying for your son, who are we to cry for Hussein? You know, what worth or value do our tears have? But it is our sharaf and our honor and our knowledge of your generosity that you will not deny us this, that you will also grace our majlis, inshallah, and bless us so that when we shed tears for your son Hussein, our hajat as well may be accepted, inshallah. And the Imam's generosity, particularly when it comes to the Majlis of Hussein, we find that you know, the manner in which they show respect to the people who hold the Majlis of Hussein would embarrass us. 
You know, the famous incident we mentioned that after the incident of Karbala, when a man invited Sayyidu Sajideen, our fourth Imam, and said to him, Ya Rasulillah, my daughter is getting married, will you come to the wedding? And the Imam said that after I saw my father being slaughtered hungry and thirsty, I do not attend weddings. And the man said, Ya Rasulillah, is there something I can do that will bless my house with your presence? And the Imam said, hold the majlis of my father, Hussein. This has become our tradition, isn't it? Even when we have a wedding, we start with the majlis of Hussein. It is strange. People don't understand this. That why is it that your child is getting married, but you start with crying for Hussein? Why? Because this is the sunnah of Zainul Abidin, that we hope he comes to our majlis. And the man said, I will certainly hold the majlis for your father, Hussein. And he keeps the majlis. And he brings in someone to recite Ash'ar, someone to recite the Masaib of Hussein. And he's standing by the door. He's welcoming people. And the majlis has started. And he's restless. He's thinking, it is not like my imam to promise me and not show up. My imam promised he will come. Why has he not come? And he keeps waiting for the imam to come. And he keeps waiting. And the imam does not show up to where the majlis is being held. He finally gives up and says, let me go and stand out on the road. Perhaps I will see the Imam coming. When he steps out, he finds Imam Zainul Abidin (laughs) is arranging the slippers of the Azadar. (laughs) Yabna Rasulillah, you are arranging the sandals of the people who have come from Azad. He says, you do not know the maqam of those who come and cry for my father, Hussain. (laughs) Ajrukum ala Allah. These are the days and nights to cry for Hussain. Ajrukum ala Allah. Last night we said that Hussein, who lived all his life in Medina, this Medina that was so dear to him, he now bids farewell to Medina for good on the 28th of Rajab. It was the practice of the people of Medina that when someone was leaving, they would escort him to a point outside Medina near a tree that was known as Shajaratul Wida. This was the place of farewell. So the Banu Hashim come out with Hussein and his small qafila to Shajaratul Wida. And from there, they are parting for the last time. And there are different forms of Masaib. I do not know how it must have been for Hussein to see the walls of Medina for the last time and realize I will never see this again. But some of the Arbab of Azar say that at that point, his daughter Fatima Sughra took hold of his little brother, her little brother Ali Yunil Asghar. And we are told that no matter who tried to take the baby from Fatima Sughra, the baby would not leave until Hussein himself had to come. And he whispered something in the ears of the baby and the baby jumped out from Fatima Sughra's hand to Hussein. History does not tell us what is it that Hussein said to his baby, but perhaps he said to him, my son Ali, Karbala will remain incomplete without your blood. And Ali Yunil Asghar is just a newborn infant at that point. They begin leaving Medina. But as Hussein is looking at the walls of Medina, I am sure that Zainab and Umm Kulthum as well are looking at Medina. And when you look at the city that you love, when you look at your home that you love, as you leave, you look back and you look with anxiety and think, when will I come back? I wish I come back soon again home. I wish I could return to my home again. But alas for Zainab, if she felt that when she left, certainly when Zainab came back, she did not feel the same. When Zainab returned to Medina, she did not want to enter Medina. Some of the Arabab of Azar say that when Zainab saw Medina for the first time, she fell from her camel as soon as she saw the walls of Medina. Um Kulthum began reciting Medina to Jaddina la taqbalina fa bil hasarati wal ahzani ji'na. O Medina of our Jad, do not welcome us again. We have returned with sorrow and grief. Kharajna minki bil ahlina jam'a. Raja'na la rijalam wa la banina. O Medina, we left you with all our men and all our brothers. We have returned without anyone. Ajrukum ala Allah. The Qafila of Hussein came to Mecca. Hussein stayed in Mecca for four months and ten days. Words began spreading around that the grandson of the Prophet is in Mecca now. That Hussein will not do bay'ah of Yazid. That Hussein has said, Mithli la yubay'ah mithlu Yazid. One who is like me will not do bay'ah to one who is like Yazid. And news began spreading and people would come for Umrah and they would come and do salam and pay their respects to the grandson of the Prophet. This was the month of uh, Shaban and Ramadan and Shawwal and Dilqad until the month of Hajj was approaching. The people of Kufa found out that Hussein has refused to do bay'ah of Yazid. They began writing letters to him and saying, Ya Rasulillah, come to us and lead us and we will fight Yazid. Ya Rasulillah, we need a guide. 
and they signed petitions to say we have a hundred thousand swords waiting for you oh Hussein and Hussein knew that these people were not people to be trusted these are people who betrayed my father Ali these are people who betrayed my brother Hassan but as an Imam as a Hujja he could not simply ignore their request so he sends an ambassador to them he sends his cousin Muslim bin Aqil Muslim bin Aqil goes to Kufa and the people of Kufa at first welcome Muslim but then as Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad comes into Kufa they betray him on the 8th of Dhul Hijjah before that Hussein finds out that Yazid has hatched a plot to assassinate Hussein while he's doing tawaf of the Kaaba. Gharib Hussein decides I will not allow this to happen in a place that is as sacred as the Kaaba. And on the 8th of Dhul Hijjah, the day of Tarwiyah, Hussein changes his intention from Hajj to Umrah and removes his ihram and a small band of people with Hussein are now leaving Makkah and heading towards Kufa. Hussein does this with strategy and I've mentioned this before that Hussein was not caught by surprise that Hussein was not taken with by surprise without knowing what was happening if he wished he could have left earlier because Muslim was there and there were requests coming in from Kufa but the reason Hussein leaves on the 8th of Dhul Hijjah is because every person who goes for Hajj and leaves for Arafat on the 9th of Dhul Hijjah has to be in Mecca on the 8th of Dhul Hijjah so Hussein wants everyone to see the Madlumiyah of the grandson of the Prophet that everyone who went to Arafat should not be able to say to Allah on the day of judgment that if I knew the son of Zahra was Gharib I would have gone with Hussein and I would not have gone to Arafat but a small band lives with Hussein and they head towards Kufa and as Hussein is heading towards Kufa in his knowledge of the ghaib as Muslim bin Aqil is being thrown from Darul Imara and he does salam to his Aqa and says Assalamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah Hussein knows that Muslim has been killed he says wa alayka salam ya Muslim the news of Muslims shahada comes to Hussein Hussein comes into the tent Hussein says call me the daughter of Muslim Muslim had a young daughter like Hussein Sakina this daughter some say was called Ruqayya and some say was called Hamida Hussein calls Hamida and sits her besides him then he begins to rub his hand on the head of Hamida Hamida is clever she is a child from the Ahlul Bayt she looks at her uncle Hussein and says Amma have I become Yatim why do you deal with me as you deal with orphans but Hussein does not know what to say to the young child he asks for a small pair of earrings he puts little earrings on the ears of Hamida he says oh Hamida from today I am your Baba oh Hamida from today Ali Unil Akbar is your brother I would say Aqa Hussein do not let Sakina see this if Sakina sees you putting earrings on Hamida she might think this is how people deal with Aitam it will be very different for Sakina on the day of Ashura Ajurukum Allah Hussein continues his journey towards Kufa on the way he meets the army of Hur Hor stops Hussein from going into Kufa, but Hussein continues north, staying with Furat. As he continues his journey, he comes to a land in the desert where his horse will not move forward. Hussein gets off his horse and says, Bring me another horse. The Imam gets on a second horse. That horse will not move forward. He asks for a third horse. When Hussein has changed seven horses, but the horse will refuse to move forward, the Imam says, Who are the people who live in this vicinity? They are told it is the Banu Asad who live here. But Imam Hussein says, Bring the Banu Asad to me. He calls the Banu Asad to him. He says to them, O oh, Banu Asad, does this land have a name? They said, yes, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, this place is called Taf. He said, does it have another name? They said, yes, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, this place is called Shattul Furat. He said, yes, but is there another name? They said, yes, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, this place is also called Al Qama. He said, does it have another name as well? He said, yes. They said, yes, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, this place is also called Nainawa. Then he said, does it have another name? They said, no, it does not have another name. But then an old man stood up. He said, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, do not stop on this land. This land is cursed. Whoever stopped here, is always suffer, always faces suffering and affliction. O oh, Yabna Rasulillah, this place is also called Arda Karbam Wabala. Whoever stops here is afflicted with suffering. When Hussein had Karbala, he said, Abbas, in Zilu, Abbas, we have reached home. Abbas, put the tents here. Abbas, this is where we will stop. He called the Banu Asad. He said, Oh Banu Asad, will you sell this land to me? They said, Yabna Rasulillah, this land is yours. He said, 
said, no, I will purchase it from you. He purchased the land from them. After he had purchased it, then he said, I give this land back to you now, O Banu Asad, but on a condition that you promise me one thing. They said, what will be promised to you, Ibn Rasulullah? He said, look, we will be killed on this land. And after we are killed, our bodies will be left under the hot sun. There will be no one to bury us. You must promise that after the enemies have left, you will come and bury us. They said, we promise you, Ibn Rasulullah. Hussein was not satisfied. He said, now call your women. The women of Banu Asad came. He said, oh, women of Banu Asad, if your men are afraid of the army of Yazid, then they won't bury us. Then when you go and fetch water from Furat, then you try and bury our bodies. The women promised, Ya Abna Rasulillah, we will bury you. Hussein was still not satisfied. He said, now call your children. He called the children of Banu Asad. He said, oh, children of Banu Asad, if your mothers are afraid to bury us, when you come out playing into the desert, take some handfuls of sand and throw it on our bodies so that they too may be buried. Ajrukum Allah, Ajrukum Allah. Bas Abbas began pitching the tents in Karbala. When Zainab saw the tents are being pitched, Brother Hussein, my dear brothers and sisters, when you go to Karbala, how anxious you are to reach Karbala. Your heart keeps telling you, I wish I could come to Karbala. Oh, Karbala, when you see the dome of Abbas, you say, at last I have reached Karbala. But when Zainab reached Karbala, Zainab did not want to enter Karbala. She called her brother Hussein. She said, oh, Hussein, can we not stop here and go somewhere else? Hussein asked her, my sister Zainab, why do you not want to stop here? She said, Wallah, kad adkhalani hawlan azima. Hussein, there is a great anxiety that has entered my heart. I do not wish to stop here. Oh Zainab, what is it that bothers you with this land? She said, my brother Hussein, can you not hear? There is a voice of a woman crying. It is like a mother crying for her son. I can hear hear someone crying wa madluma wa gariba zainab do you not recognize the voice of our mother zahra zainab ha huna yaqtulu rijaluna this is where our men will be killed ha huna yudbahu atfaluna this is where our children will be slaughtered this is where you will be tied in robes wa husaina wa madluma Wa Gariba Matame Hussein. Yeah.